recording on the on um, tonight. So we did that last week and popped it up on our YouTube channel, and that worked quite well. So we'll do that again. To get started, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which um, we meet tonight. And for me, that's the Muanina people in Hobart, and um, pay respect to traditional owners across Australia. Um, and acknowledge them as the continuing custodians of the land on which we meet. So it gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce our guests, Tony Castro, Simon Russell and Rob White from the UK. Um, Tony Castro is a yacht designer and naval architect. He's CEO of Sports Boat World and um, was, as the, is the designer of the SB20. He was born um, in Lisbon in Portugal and started sailing with his father when he was only eight years, of, eight, eight years of age. And if we fast forward to today, Tony, you're a world-class designer of super yachts, some very impressive super yachts, I might add, power boats and sailing yachts, and there are over 10,000 boats on the waters around the globe with the Tony Castro stamp. Can you um, fill us in on your journey? Hi, Jane. Hi, everybody. Um, well, um, well, basically, uh, I, I grew up in Lisbon, as you say, and um, I was, uh, my father actually had a little 10 meter wooden boat that he used to take us out. And um, I, I basically very soon became literally obsessed with sailing. And, um, and, and yeah, so from, from, from about eight years old, I, I, hardly, I hardly did anything else. Uh, when when I could, and um, yeah, so that's where it had basically started, and um, then of course then later on I went to study naval architecture and uh, and the things developed to to what they are now. Let's say it's a bit of a long story. I don't know if you want to hear all of it because you've been here for a long time. But, uh, uh, we've got a few more minutes. You can tell us a little bit more, Tony. Yeah. Well, basically, uh, so I started very early um, and uh, I used to, uh, I went to sailing, to sailing school when I was eight um, and then at about 10, I was made an instructor. So I was teaching my eight year old kids to, to sail and, you know, I was already doing quite a lot of racing and uh, curiously, um, because I was always hanging around the, the marina, which was like a dock in those days, more like a dock than a marina. Uh, Any time there was a, somebody didn't turn up as a crew for any of the other classes, they always used to go and get this stupid kid that all he talked about was sailing. So everybody went to look for me. So um, quite, I, I mean, I think my first national championship, I was 12 years old when I won the national snipe. Uh, crewing for, I mean, I mean, I could hardly do anything as, as a 12 year old, probably only weighed about 55 kilos or something like that. But I was already sailing with really good people, you know, that um, whose crew happened to be ill or, or didn't turn up. So I, I won several national championships like this. Possibly my contribution was very little, uh, but I was doing a lot of listening, that's for sure. So, you know, I sailed Flying Dutchman, I sailed uh, uh, Sharpie, 12 meter Sharpies, um, and also Vogas, which was a, a kind of a Portuguese version of the Soling. And then at, um, at 17, uh, my parents, they sent me to Scotland to study naval architecture. So when I arrived in Scotland, uh, obviously, Scotland was very developed by Portuguese standards. You know, there was already quite a lot of uh, serious uh, yacht racing at that time. And uh, I hooked up with what was then possibly the best Scottish sailor. There was a guy called Bill Mackay, who had just built a 40-foot one-tonner. So within a very short period of time, uh, you know, I got to meet the English crowd, you know, which was then, of course, one of the most sophisticated uh, yachting fraternities in the world, you know, possibly together with some Australians, Americans, Argentinians, Germans, and so on. So my first Admiral's Cup was in 1973. And, um, and then um, uh, I did my first degree 
finished in 75. Uh, unfortunately, there was a revolution in Portugal at the time. So uh, I couldn't go back home. And I decided to have to find something, including some work. So I persuaded uh, the other university in, in Glasgow, in Scotland, to allow me to do a PhD in uh, aerodynamics and hydrodynamics. But of course, I had a very devious reason for doing this. And that's because the PhD in those days had no lessons. It was basically a pure research degree. And you didn't have to, you hardly didn't have to do anything uh, or re re answer to anybody. More to the point, yachting was a very new subject and there was nobody in the entire university who was conversant with you know, the kind of things which I wanted to, uh, to study. So I literally had not even a supervisor. So that allowed me to go sailing for half the year or all over the world. And the other half of the year, I, I used to go back to my university and play around in the tank and the wind tunnel, which was absolutely marvelous. So I became a, a navigator and, uh, and then I sailed around the world, you know, working for, you know, all sorts of uh, different, uh, mostly Americans, um, uh, you know, so, you know, in the early days of, uh, you know, the Onion Patch series and the big boat series in San Francisco and, uh, and so on. And, uh, and then after finishing my, my uh, for, uh, during that time, of course, I met all the other yacht designers, which were a little bit older than me, like Ron Holland and German Frères and, um, you know, uh, other people like uh, uh, around the world, let's say. And um, uh, one, one day I got a phone call from Ron Holland saying that he had, he had got his first job. He was coming to Europe to design this boat for an Irishman. And um, would I like to join? Because at the time I was a very kind of a number cruncher kind of person. Whereas Ron was a, a very traditional kind of seat to the pants type yacht designer, if you like. So he needed somebody to sort of a crunch a few numbers and make sure things worked. So uh, he, I remember it very well because he called me, it was 10 past eight in the morning. And I remember uh, that there was a flight to Cork at, uh, I think it was 11.30 that morning. And I took that flight and I never came back. Fabulous introduction. Thank, thanks so much, Tony. We'll, um, we'll come back to some of your um, achievements as well. It's um, yeah, what a lovely start. And I think there'd be many people who'd love the uh, university where you don't have quite the study commitments and you seem to be master of your own destiny. Sounds, sounds like the perfect study to me. Um, I'll go. I'll go to you, Rob. Um, Rob. Rob's the class appointed SB20 um, builder and is with White Formula UK. Um, it's been really interesting finding out a little bit more about our guest tonight. Um, Rob's a dual Olympian, has won numerous world championships, um, European and national titles, sailing the Tornado catamaran. I thought I was being pretty brave in Perth recently on a little catamaran there till I saw the people fly, uh, sailing the tornadoes and then the foiling catamaran, so I've got a bit of work to do. Um, he's been involved in sailing his whole life, but not just on the water, also in the workshop building, building boats. Um, his many years of sailing and building boats has given him a vast amount of knowledge to understand what makes a boat go fast, which I think is what we're all about um, at times. His involvement with the SB20 go, well, the SB goes back a long way from building the very first 68 boats and then starting the rebuild of the SB20 with Sports Boat World. Um, Rob, can you give us a bit of background on your boat building history and your reconnection with the SB20? Yeah, okay. So, um, well, good evening, everyone, I suppose. Uh, yes, my, uh, my background is very different to Tony's. Uh, mine's all sort of seat of the pants stuff. I was fortunate to have a father who uh, had his own built boat building company and uh, I used to go and play around as soon as I finished school or if I skipped school I'd go and play around building stuff in the in the in the factory and uh, then he said one day oh you might as well we'll build a boat together so we built the first boat which was a torch dinghy uh, sort of a bit like a I don't know if you have GP14s but a pretty slow slow boat they used them in sailing schools and stuff and uh, I always just said, you know, I want to be a tiller man like you, Dad. And uh, hence my boat was called Tiller Man. So 
So uh, that boat was also used to, to ferry some of the employees to some of the boats that were moored up. And so it got a bit bashed around, but we, we had a lot of fun doing it. And then eventually said, well, about time you have something better than that. So we made a Hornet. And I don't know if any of you guys know Hornets, but uh, my father raced Hornets. He was world champion in the, in the Hornet. And pretty well, I sort of just, whatever he's done, I've sort of followed. So we've sort of, uh, he, he was my best mate, taught me everything I knew. Um, unlike Tony, as I say, I just sort of skipped school most of my life and just went sailing and the job worked out okay for me that way. But. Had a pretty impressive um, career though, Rob. And, and your son, Rupert, he works with you, is that correct? Or? Yeah, I've got, uh, I've got four boys. Uh, my my uh, eldest Thomas, uh, he does a lot of the paperwork. He runs the CNC machine, and I've got uh, Henry. He's more on production side. Uh, then I've got Freddie, who works part time, but there's uh, on the TP52 circuit. And then my youngest Rupert, very much like Dad and myself, seat of the pants sailor, um, sailing sailing nacras. Uh, He's not been sailing for the last eight months because he smashed his leg up while well, sailing. So but, it's not good. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's sort of trying to trying to recover. Well, we wish him a speedy recovery too. Um, and Simon, have we got you at the moment yet, audio wise or not? We can try. Have you got? Oh, you know? we are. Yes. Oh, <laughs> The um, challenges of technology. Um, Simon Russell joined Sportsboat World in 2018 to lead the manufacture and the worldwide distribution of the SB20. Um, Simon, also known as Fumesy to his mates, is no slouch on the water. Simon, just a quick um, quick summary of your sailing career and some of your um, proudest moments on the water before we get into a few questions from the audience. Um, well, I, I mean, I started um, a bit like Rob. It was uh, it was it was fun. It was it was grassroots sailing at a local um, gravel pit actually. I, I, I grew up in the Cotswolds which is about as far away from the water as you can get in the UK. So everybody had horses and, uh, and used to go shooting animals and what have you. And um, we had this boat in our garden and everybody thought we were a bit odd. Um, but we went sailing. We, <laughs> we, uh, we um, anyway, I, I went through the whole cadet thing and my parents used to drop me off at the club every, I mean that's all we did. You know, this is back in the 70s and uh, um, all we all our only hobby was was sailing really, and we did that every weekend throughout the season. My parents would kick me out of the of the car, and we'd go mess about half the day. Then we'd do a bit of racing, capsize practice, and all that sort of fun. And then I'd find them at the bar later in the day and drag them home, and then uh, look forward to doing it again the next weekend. And um, eventually, I guess my folks grew out of the of this hundred acre gravel pit, and. Um, <laughs> And we sort of moved up into sort of mini tunners and we moved, um, we used to sail down in Plymouth, um, which used to be about a two hour commute. Um, and, and then we it gradually progressed to bigger boats. And then my parents ended up with a boat in Solon. And um, I used to, used to commute down. I was still living in the Cotswolds. I used to commute down at weekends and eventually got to know the locals, found the best pub in Hamble, which was the King and Queen, and then spent half my life in there. Um, met up with a load of great sailing friends, which I've still got today, and, and, my, and my career sort of went from there. And, and it's just through networking with people. Um, and sailing wise, I suppose, um, you know, I mean, I, I've always been passionate about one design boats. And uh, so, you know, we've I've been successful in the Etrals and the Melgis, um, J24s in the UK. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's really a a sort of particular highlight really but it's just having that fun in one design boats has been has been a big thing for me thanks very much simon i think very modest i think you've got a couple of world championships under your belt there too that you might might not have shared with the panel tonight <laughs> so um, um anyway we're in uh, he was being very modest i think uh, simon and also rob i mean his father reg was a phenomenal sailor mm. in, uh, my, my, I mean, your father represented Britain in the Olympics in the tornado. Am I right? Yeah, so, yeah, he won a gold medal in the tornado, yeah. Yeah, well, you didn't say that. I mean, you know, he, had a, <laughs> he, was bloody, he was a bloody amazing sailor, you know, so no wonder his, his siblings are pretty good at the job they do, you know. I have a very modest team in the SBW, I must say. <laughs> oh, they do very good work, <laughs> 
So look, I'm going to hand over to Scott and Chris now who are going to take some um, questions or share some questions that we've received during the week from the audience. So don't forget if you'd like to pose a question to the panel, please just pop it into the chat and we'll take those during the night. Um, Scott, over to you. Thanks, Charlie. Um, lovely to hear from uh, the experts that we've got on tonight. Uh, one of the first questions we've got is to Tony. Um, how did you find the formula to create um, a great one design boat, the SBs and the 720, in a, in a time in the world when classes like the Etchels and the Dragons were so strong? Uh, well, uh, a bit of luck, of course. Um, basically, the a little bit of how we got to this to this stage was that some years previous to to the SB twenty, I, I designed a boat uh, called the seventeen twenty, otherwise known as the Cork One design, after fifteen members of the Royal Cork Yacht Club uh, asked me to design a boat for all fifteen members. And because they were, uh, they had, oh, they all had very old J twenty fourth, and they wanted to go on to do something a bit more modern. So that was, if you like, the beginning of the so called sports boat idea. Uh, and also, uh, a lot of them were not exactly, you know, very very young guys. So we wanted to make sure we had a, a boat easy to sail that was not too physically dependent. Uh, so some ideas grew out of that, you know, the, 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 the idea of not having to hike like an idiot uh, over the side of the boat, like you see other boats doing, or, uh, you know, maybe dispensing with an interior if all you want to do is to do a little bit of sailing uh, during the daytime. So that, that's how the sports boat grew. Then after a few years, uh, Laser was thinking of going up in size to bigger boats. And they approached me to talk about that concept of a sports boat. And uh, we then uh, decided that um, based on the experience with the 1720, we wanted uh, to make a boat slightly smaller, slightly cheaper, easier to sail, less loads, particularly less loads on the jib sheet and, uh, and so on. So we then uh, drove the concept down towards the... Um, the what uh, six, a six meter boat instead of a seven meter, which was what the 1720 was, and um, and that's how the, I feel like that's the very beginning of the of the SB uh, also the SB20. One one aspect which I think made the boat uh, really um, really good is, was that we were allowed to to build the prototype, and this prototype. Uh, we sailed, uh, we made it out of wood and fiberglass, if you like, it was not from a mold. We built this boat and we sailed it, we employed actually crew to sail it for three months every day. So they sailed every day in the Solent here, you know, trying to get some, some data, trying to get some uh, um, information uh, and of course also waiting for uh, bad weather, lots of wind, too much wind. And, and that way we started to fine tune what we call the performance profile of the boat. So, you know, originally uh, we, we had a boat that was quite easy to sail up to about, uh, I'd say up to 24 knots, 25 knots through. Then we decided to extend the performance profile a little bit up. And we ended up, you know, managing basically quite comfortably up to about 29 knots. And it was this process, looking at the hull, looking at all the aspects of the design, slight, you know, small improvements, little things, also looking at the rig, the sails. So I think all of those things put together basically created a boat that when it started being built, did not suffer any modifications whatsoever. And, and it helped. If, if I had done something stupid or wrong, you could have helped if you like to correct it. As it happens, we didn't have to worry about big things. We just had to worry about small improvements, all of them which we really enjoyed having the opportunity 
uh, to do. I mean, in my lifetime, I've done 500 designs, only twice I was allowed to make a prototype. So uh, it was a great opportunity. And to me, it's no surprise that the boat came out as good as it was. We, we did all the right things. We had the right people involved in helping us uh, at the beginning from laser and otherwise from the mast makers, from the sail makers. And really that's how you create a good boat. Well, thanks for that. Um, Simon, um, what was it attracted you to the SB20 class and, uh, and led you to become the, the builder for us? Um, well, I, I was involved back in, back in the sort of early 2000s. I was working for a company called Jack Holt and um, we were a deck hardware supplier. Uh, well, well they, they're not actually um, in business anymore, but um, w we were involved with laser quite a bit back then, um, supplying a lot of the you know, laser dinghies. And, and I sort of got a bit involved. I was really pushing quite hard to, to get the deck hardware there on the boat with laser. Um, and I think the decision had already been made um, that um, Harkin were going to get the the, uh, the, the business. Um, but I managed to get a few bits on there. So I, I sort of got quite interested in the boat in the very early days and, and, um, and did a bit of sailing in, on the, on the uh, prototype boat. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was just a really good little boat. It was about the time I was doing, I was doing etchels and I just thought this, this boat sort of fits the bill. It's a really good all-round little boat. And, and, and I did a couple of... Um, um, uh, carries weeks and a few regattas in the boats in the early days and, and really enjoyed the one design racing and the big numbers that we had then as well. Um, so it's always been there, it's always been a, a boat I've looked on and when the opportunity came to you know to, to work with Tony and I sort of jumped at it because I think there's you know there's still a lot of work to be done and, and there's still a, a good future for the boat. That's good yeah no I think they're, uh, they're a wonderful boat to sail and we all get a lot of fun out of them. Yeah. Chris you've got a couple of questions there. Yeah, I might stick with the kind of boat theme, uh, Scotty. And I, I note, I think David from Ireland mentioned here about uh, wanting to make sure, I think all the new boats that are uh, getting built for the Irish fleet were going to be the, the fastest ones yet. But um, one, of, one of my questions, obviously, with the Nationals we've just had is it was one by probably one of the older boats in the fleet. And I was just you know, interested in maybe Rob's thoughts on you know, the differences between the boats, if there are any, and so forth, given he's obviously been involved with building a lot of them over the, over the journey. Okay, well, in, I mean, in the, in the beginning, uh, I, I, I got involved just before it went in production, and I, uh, I was asked to go up to Laser and, and sit there with Tim Coventry and, and uh, everybody, and, and they said, well, how do you build it? And we had all these different guys out and about, you know, we weren't going to look for the lightest thing. We wanted a boat that was very resilient, last last time, uh, wouldn't be expensive to maintain, and all the rest of it. That's basically what Tony's saying. So uh, at the time, I was actually making the uh, Melchus 24. And uh, when we were all having this discussion, Tim Condry just turned around and he said, well, what laminate would you use? I said, well, we'll just use... Uh, a, a laminate that is not too dissimilar from the 24 because that was well well produced and stuff, uh, and that's pretty where we are today. I mean, you could make, you can make the boat lighter, uh, and I think one of the, the the big things with with the boat is that you know if they're made properly, um, they will last a very long time. The laminate has pretty well been the same uh, since day one. Certainly, of all the boats that I built. Um, I built the first five boats and I've made the last 68 so far. I think it is something like, like that. And they've all been built to the same specification. There's obviously a gap in the middle where sort of things went awry. So I, I don't really know what the laminate was, but it should be pretty close to where we, we are today. And it just makes for a boat that lasts a long, long time. Now, when, when, when we went, so when uh, we started off again with uh, Jerry and Alan, we we took a, the the boat apart and checked it all, and we the, we asked ourselves questions. Well, you know, how can we make the boat faster? Well, you can do things to make boats faster, remove the keel position and and stuff like that and whatever. But the decision was made to just make it the same as we did from the beginning, to keep everything the same. Because otherwise, if you make a boat faster. Then all the other boats are 
uh, become redundant and it ends up with a bit of an arms race. Everybody has to have a new boat. So, but in, in essence, what I'm really saying, if you've got an old boat, it's well built, well built. It's no reason it shouldn't be as fast as uh, a new one. I mean, it, you know, they do get softer over time. So eventually the new ones become faster. Uh, but the guy who won the world, he's an exceptional sailor. Uh, you know, they're on the youth program and I may, may just outsail everybody. That's the only answer I can give you. No, it's, well, I think, you know, the point you make is quite right. I think that the, the, both the national team here was well sailed by one of our youth teams. And, uh, you know, there were newer boats on the track, but, um, you know, I suppose a, a good old boat will beat a, a poorly sailed new boat, probably. Yeah. That's the yeah. way it should be. <laughs> yeah, and I think we've, we've achieved and, and maintained everything that we set out to do. Yeah. Chris, what are the things? Yeah, just had a, had a um, question from Sinem in Turkey, what, uh, and I think it's something you might be going to later, but um, what is the future of SV20 and is a carbon addition on the way? And if so, what's the likely budget? Is that a question for me? I think that might be for you, Tony. It, it could be for you, Tony. There were some people who sometimes they live in areas where they there's not many SV20s and, and they wanted to uh, basically still go racing and, and participate on racing with, with other boats. And uh, in the very early days, there was the, the sports boat rule specifically for sports boats um, that was popular, you know, run by the ROC here in England under the kind of IRC uh, umbrella. And then that got uh, amalgamated into the big rule and you know some of the European countries don't necessarily, you know, follow the, uh, the English uh, rules. So some Italians and so on they wanted to sail under the ORC, you know, the the old uh, uh, you know inter the more international uh, racing uh, rules. And um, and I think the interest has just grown a little bit in trying to make uh, uh, the boat. Uh, competitive into that uh, into that class, and it so happens that somebody finally came along and said, "Look, I'm doing more sailing under ORC than I am under the SP20 because locally here there's not many other SP20s. So why don't we make a you know can I change the SP20 uh, just to make the boat uh, faster and different and maybe more suitable for that particular rule?" So. Um, after a little a little persuasion, we we talked about well why why don't we just go further than that and make a, you know make a carbon version of the SV20 so that it becomes a boat specifically for sailing under the ORC and the IRC um, and and do those kind of races which are also the, you know the eight some some races are not triangles or Olympic courses they are sort of A to B, A to B races. We have around the island race here in England, which yeah. people like to do, a bit more quasi, quasi offshore racing. And um, so that's how the idea sort of came about. So the first, the first boat happens to be for a Swiss owner, which has uh, been in build with Rob's for a, for a little while now. Hopefully with this coronavirus now, uh, on its way out, you know, we will be able to finish it and deliver it to to the Swiss owner. And uh, so it basically is an all carbon boat, uh, mast, carbon rig, everything. Yeah. Uh, it has got the same keel, but you, overall it will be something like 150 kilos lighter boat, yeah. so not considerably lighter. Um, and a slightly different sail plan. Uh, it's got a you know a square square head mainsail and yep. a twin backstays, and and that's it really. It's just a, yep. an exper an experiment to see how uh, it goes under under ORC race. Obviously, that boat is not eligible to sail under the one design rules no. of the SP20, and yep. it's gonna you know it's basically the SP21. <laughs> 
I think they'll, uh, there's a, a, a well-known uh, owner in Tasmania that likes tinkering around with IRC boats, so he, he might be customer number two for you. <laughs> Great. Let's talk about it. Yeah, Rob is ready. Rob is already yeah. done. Got to get this finished almost first. finished the first one. So he knows. So he's ready to go. <laughs> you were so, talking there, Tony, about the, the sales and so forth. Is uh, maybe a question for either for Rob or Simon, but you know, lots of discussion at the regattas around the sales and. You know, is there are there any planned developments in the horizon to look at? You know, trying to maybe improve the the you know the sales we're using, or is that uh, we're sticking with the kind of current um, manufacturer and so forth? Well, I think personally, I'm much more interested in improving the experience that you have with the boat than the boat itself, yeah. and I think that's really what's important for the future. Whether the boat is 5% faster or 10%, who cares? You know, I don't think that is the really aim that I have. You know, I would like to improve the experience. I would like to improve the events. I would like to change the events. I would like to create new things that are more fun to do with that boat. And you know, we would like to keep the boat you know, interesting to look at. You know, we don't want it to be, you know, become ugly or old fashioned or anything like that. Yeah, but I am much less interested in, yeah. uh, in whether the sales, yeah. I mean, and also for starters, if we want to make a strict one design, we must make sure that we, we, we don't make the newer boats faster than the old ones because you destroy the very essence of the, of the one design and you then destroy the big fleets because then people who have a slightly older boat they say, I've got no chance in hell. I'm not going to go. Oh. Yeah. So I think it's very important that uh, the, the new boats are only perceived to be faster uh, rather than real, really faster. Uh, of course, what tends to happen is that some of the keener, better sales, sailors usually found themselves on the newer boats. But that's, uh, I think in a lot of classes, that's more of a coincidence. You know, they, they probably feel they need and new boats to minimize their chances of losing. But they would win anyway. But, you know, that's how, that's life. Um, one thing from uh, Simon, you've got, uh, you created an SB20 spotting group to try and dig the old boats out. Is, um, is that going very well? And what's your, your plan for trying to communicate with these guys and and get the boats that are sitting out there a bit more active? Well, well, I think that what we found, I mean, as, as it, it's important to build new boats and keep the fleet building in that respect, um, there's about 800 odd boats somewhere around the world. And, um, you know, we found even just locally around, around the Solent area, there's probably even 10 or 15 boats that have been sat in gardens or, or under trees and, and sort of festering away. And I think that, the way the fleet is certainly in the UK it's had it's peaked and it's sort of leveled off and I think that we need to try and get these other boats sailing and get people into the class it's a it's a fantastic opportunity and great value for money between two or three owners to buy a boat and go out and do some really competitive racing so it, it's I think we're attacking it from both ends so we, you know obviously our main business is to try and sell new boats but I think the other end is to get these other boats sailing get the fleets out and visible again and, and then try and get the whole thing rolling again. And um, that's, that's our sort of, uh, one of our priorities. So that's why I've tried, we, we tried this site and we, we're just looking for boats. That probably leads on to, to another question and that is a little bit more to um, the remoteness of Australia and what, what thoughts you might have about uh, sports boat world, being able to assist us in growing the class down here. Um, as you know, we've got one of the biggest fleets down in Hobart at the moment, and, and that nationally we're trying to grow some fleets around Australia, and we'd be interested to hear what ideas you might have about how we can uh, get some more boats out of the woodwork and, and some fleets established. Well, like, I guess I guess it's, you know, communicating with you guys, and, and you know, if, if there's a demand and we can find these boats wherever they are, whether they're in the UK or dotted around Europe, is, is to try and find them, and then... Um, and you know, get them to you, to get them to you guys. But I think 
as I said, I think it's, you know, there's, there's, there's two different sailors. There's probably the guys that are wanting the new boats, but I think it's important to keep those other boats going. So maybe you, there's a demand at both ends. So I think that's what we need to try and try and work together and, and, and um, you know, get some boats to you, I guess. It'd be nice to sell some new ones down there as well. No, you sold them all before the world. That's the problem. <laughs> Wait, can I, could I, if, can if, I add something to that um, uh, uh, thread conversation? Um, one of the things that um, we are doing is to uh, see if we can build up the business of uh, renting the boats for racing. And this idea was uh, started off by uh, an SP20 owner in Portugal who now has 14 SB20s. And he has a business of race ready boats. So he charters these SB20s for 300 quid a day. And he, and anybody can rent it. And the boat is on the water, ready to sail or ready to race, I should say. Uh, and then on the way back, they leave it in, in the marina and they can go home and the boat gets taken care of, you know, cleaned, unpacked, whatever you want to call it. It's, and then the, the business is called Sail Cascai and, and it's on, it's on break all, you know, seven days a week. And during the, during the week, he's obviously doing corporate events and, uh, uh, you know, lending boats to people who want to do some, I don't know, some cruising or whatever. And then other times he, he rents them for the, for the events, you know, the winter series and so on. And I mean, we, we have three boats now. In, uh, I mean, talk about sports boat world in England. We now own three, three boats and uh, we're trying to do the same thing. So we have them on these uh, slip docks uh, in the marina. So it takes about, I don't know, 10 minutes to launch the boat. So you don't have to crane it from a trailer or anything. The boat is literally six inches above the water. And, and uh, we're trying to see if we can promote this idea of come and try the boat. Because you know people can, can have a nice winter series Right, so it's a hundred, a hundred pounds a day for each of the crew, right? Which is, you know, it's like ch probably cheaper than going out for dinner, and uh, and they can have a, a, a race an event and see if they like it, and then they can either continue to rent if they don't want to buy. But what has ha what has happened in Portugal is that on the back of this thing, uh, quite a lot of people they bought they bought a boat for themselves. In, in some cases, they bought used boats first, but it kept the whole thing busy. And Simon will tell you that, you know, last year there was quite a lot of uh, secondhand boats shifting to the extent that uh, relatively recent boats disappeared. There was none left for sale. There, there are none left. Um, I think one of the new ones was ours, one of ours, and we sold that one to a Brazilian owner at the end of last year. Um, and now Simon, as he's told you, he's been uh, trying to find other boats around. We've, he's found another one yesterday under the tree for the last seven years. And, uh, and what we're doing is we're taking those boats, uh, buying, them, those, uh, buying those boats ourselves, and then, and then you know, basically dusting them off, cleaning them off, and, uh, and either keeping, it, keeping them to this business of renting, or possibly, um, if we end up with too many, uh, possibly you know sell them to somebody for a remarkably good value. I, I think some of these second-hand boats, which have not been sailed very much at all, and that is a formula that other countries could uh, could develop. You know, eventually, most people they like to buy their own boat, so I don't think that is a uh, bad for business, if you know what I mean. But I think it will give a lot of people the opportunity to, to, to sail an SB20 when they've got nothing else to do, for example, or people who are in an, into another class, but they don't know if they should change or not. They need to experiment it. You know, they need to see, am I going to like this? And that's a great thing. I mean, in every country, there should be at least one boat that you can rent out, at least one, for people to do these events. And, 
and I'm sure we can find the boats for you if you don't find them locally. Yes, just I was, it's a good thing. Sorry, Rob, it's just worth saying that, Tony, that um, he also bought four new boats for rent this last year as well, didn't he? Who? The That's Portuguese. Good. He had the last four boats. They were rented. Yeah, 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 yeah. The last last so year, he bought like four new boats. Bought new boats yeah. to, to rent out. Uh, yeah. I think. He, rent, he rented them all for the Worlds, and uh, he rented them all for the Winter Series. The, just that happened at the beginning of last, at the end of last year. Uh, so he's he's doing okay. He's got fourteen of them now. I, I think Simon, if you can fix the Australian exchange rate, mate, you you might find you get a few more orders. <laughs> but um, <laughs> or, or, or if you accept Australian dollars, I'm I'm certain you'll get a few more orders. But I think they're probably both problems for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I mean the, the the boat the boats you know the boats new and second hand are still you know immense value when you compare them with other other classes you know similar boats so you know we're, we, we, and that's one thing we we have really tried to do is to you know when we took over our main aim was to not suddenly come in and bang the prices up and all the rest of it we've had to do that a little bit because uh, um, price increases we've had but we you know we still the boat new is still a very competitive um, package and. Um, you know, we just need to get some, I mean, we, we have got, I think since prior to taking over the business, I think in 2018, there was only one boat sold. Um, and I think we're up to, um, we're up to about 11 or 12 now. We've just taken, actually during lockdown, business has gone completely dead, as you'd imagine. But in that, pro, in that period, we've actually sold three boats. So no spares or sales or parts, but three boats. So people are still, you know, out there prepared to spend the money and invest in the boat. So that's really good. Maybe a question for, for, for Rob, possibly just in relation to, you know, with all your knowledge of the boats and the boat building, you know, what, what advice would you give to us in relation to, you know, maintaining our boats and, and making sure they're in you know, good racing order and, and well looked after. I'm sure you've got a good, good handle on areas we need to focus on. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the main parts for me, I mean, the biggest problem with, with a lot of the boats is particularly the, the, the boats that are built in the middle is the, the bulkheads uh, have got very soft or they're, they're rotting and that obviously con contributes to the, the boat getting more flexible and therefore generally, generally slower. Um, and it's keeping the boat well ventilated. So, the, the, you know, take the hatches off, leave, you know, raise the, the main hatch, let, get some air through the boat so, so you don't get the moisture entrapment and then, you know, the, 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 the ply and everything in there will, will last much longer. Uh, the other thing to just really maintain, you know, apart from the general boat is, is obviously the keel and the rudder. Those things to me are absolute paramount. You know, if the, if the keel is slopping around in the boat, I'm sure people have always got in one and you can just feel that surge as you're going over the waves. Just, Put some packers in there to to to, to stop it from moving, and uh, just make sure you don't have any chips and stuff on the on the foils. You know, if you've got a chip, it creates just so much drag. It's it's amazing. And then just buff your buff your bottom of the boat up, or buff the hull up, and buff the foils up. Make sure they're just clean, and that is the biggest big thing anybody can do, and and the quickest thing to do. Uh, there's a couple of questions there, Chris. Too um, could the bulkhead from um, could the bulkhead kits be a spare part for SB? Sorry, say that again. Could the could bulkhead kits kits be a spare part? Um, yeah, I mean we've we've uh, fixed a few a few boats. We have a, a system where we, you can cut the old one out and put new ones back in. Have they have they gone soft? It's all C and C and just fits in two places and, and clip them together and then you just rebond them in. It's not an easy job. Uh, we have managed, if you've got someone pretty small, to take out every bulkhead in the boat and re-glass it back in. But you do need someone. Uh, well, we use a little Polish lad. Uh, he's, got happy, <laughs> he's happy to get up there and get it out. But some of them have just been... I mean, I'm amazed that some of the boats can sail with the bulkheads that are just rotten inside. Uh, to me, that's testament to the design of the boat, to be honest with you. Yeah. You know. 
And another just a, a general interest question, how long does it actually take to make an SV20 from start to finish? <laughs> how many hours? Blimey. Um, well, it, it takes us about three weeks a boat on, on, on average. Uh, we can mould a, a hull and a deck in a week and it takes the best part of the week then to the following week to uh, put it all together, glue it together, trim it off and then put all the fittings on and buff and polish it and get it ready to, to, to go out. Plus the foils, obviously. Yeah, yeah so rough, roughly we did one every three weeks. Like in the old yeah. days, we used to do a week. Wow. So, right. <laughs> and then they came back to me and they said, can you do, two? yeah, Alan said, can you build the boats for us? I said, if you want two a week, I'm getting too old for that. I'm not interested in that. But if you want one, 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 one a month, that's, that's lovely. Fair enough, too. Maybe, maybe Tony, a, a question for you. If there was, you know, obviously the, the, you've produced and sold lots of boats now over the journey. If there was one thing you'd like to change on the boats, what, what might it be? Uh, not, not, not very much. I mean, what I would like, I mean, the thing that I would like mostly to do now, like yeah. now, to the boats is to find a, a fair, reasonable way to start losing the internal ballast. Yeah. Well, I'll, because if, if the, the vast majority, if, I mean if, the vast majority of people uh, that are active are um, sailing boats with considerable amount of lead, maybe we could slowly uh, reduce that minimum weight, like say, you know, five kilos yep. every year for the next four years or something like that. That's one of the things I would like mostly to achieve. Obviously, we're trying to figure out, you know, if we did do that, um, would who do we, who would we affect? Would we affect we haven't got a, oh. too, too many people, or would, would there be an issue to actually uh, to do that? Percent. That's one of the things I would love to. It's, well, since you asked the question, that's one of the things I really would like to do now. As to what I would have done different. In initially, I, I I can hardly think of. Uh, I mean, given the given the brief, given what we wanted to achieve, I don't think we could have done much what better. Yeah. Interesting. Press audio. I think um, we've got a question there from Chapo, Jane. So yeah. So um, I'm just just going to yeah. go to Don Calvert, who's online. Don, I don't know if you've got a question that you'd like to ask us. I know that your microphone's off mute. Have you got a question for us? Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to know if Tony still remembers uh, 36 years ago and the good yacht in tree. Yeah, of course I remember. Gee, <laughs> I remember giving you a hard time about the spare oil can that you carried on the boat. Do you remember that? When the boat was checked for measurement, you know, the measures noticed this little can of oil, which, of course, he thought for a moment that uh, you were uh, of a different nationality. I won't mention which one. And thinking that you were trying to cheat with that little half a liter of extra fluid to increase the displacement of the boat. And I remember him talking to you rather aggressively and you were stunned, stunned with surprise. Why would he find strange to have a little spare oil on your boat? You know, so I, I remember all the stories, Don, all of them. <laughs> yes, well, we have very good memories of you, Tony, and uh, uh, we still have the boat and uh, it can still win a race. I heard, I heard, and you go, f you can use it for fishing as well, I've been told. <laughs> yes, well, uh, we had to build it from wood, if you remember. Oh, and, yeah, Ni and very nicely, too. <laughs> yeah, and we're very proud of it and uh, uh, my son David is now taking over from me, I, ho I hope, 
Yeah, because yeah. I'm too old now, Tony. I'm 85. Oh, it's great to hear you. It's great, great to hear your voice. Super. I bet oh, there's yeah, a lot of stories there between um, Tony and Don that we could almost have a show on those stories and, and how lovely for you to both catch up again tonight. Um, we've got one question from David Chapman. Um, when are the next Australian Worlds, Simon? No pressure, well, Simon. Um, <laughs> that, that, that really needs to be a, that's a, that's a class um, decision, really, rather than sports by world. And I mean, it would be fantastic to come to your neck of the woods because I'd love to come down myself. Um, but it should be really, um, I mean, the decision I think made, was made, um, I mean, we've got Cash Guys 21, Singapore 22, Ireland 23 and Holland. Yes, um, and I think that's quite a lot of worlds to have planned in advance, really. I, I mean, I think that's, um, you know, it should, be going, it should be going south after that for sure, definitely. And I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very up for that. And I think the class need to do that as well, for sure. We'd love to see lots we, of votes um, from Europe here for that. We had um, a, a sensational regatta in 2018, the world's event down here. It was um, absolutely brilliant. So um, we'd love to see you all back here again, that's for sure. I'm sure I'm not speaking out of turn, El Presidente and VP. <laughs> I would thought to have. <laughs> um, was there anything else, Jane, or just uh, there any other questions? I'm just a little conscious of time there for you. Um, getting, getting to um, getting to the end of to, end end of the night tonight. So, um, did you have any other comments you'd like to make, Tony, um, Simon, or Rob? Well, the only comments I would like to make is to is to uh, emphasise that we are always very interested in the in uh, your suggestions and your comments. You know, from uh, your part of the world. And uh, we welcome very much your your thoughts and your contribution, you know, to the to the class, and your enthusiasm for for everything, uh, for the great sort of uh, media job that you do, Jane. Actually, by any international standards, you know, hyperactive you are. And, um, <laughs> we I think, think that's really... the same as well. Huh? <laughs> we think the same. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I wish we could match it. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Uh, so, yeah, please, please keep coming with your suggestions. Uh, you know, obviously we have to keep the entire world uh, happy from all parts of the world. But, you know, it's very important that we hear what you think. And, um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and as, as I said earlier, um, to, to win more friends, we need to improve the events. We need to make the events uh, something you cannot resist. Uh, it's not as if the boat is irrelevant, but uh, I, I think that the secret is to make the events irresistible. And then, and then in, that, in that respect, we have to be, you know, we have to think of new, new events, new things to do, different formula, just to make it more fun to participate. I mean, you know, that is how to attract people which have the, the means, but not necessarily the, the, you know, the experience of being sailors since they were born, like a lot of us. So to attract these people, we need to make our events the place, to be, the, 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 you know, the events to go to. And that's, we need to think about how we can create new events. That's critical for the future. Thanks very much, Tony, and I think um, it's a great every note to finish on. Yeah, every the, country. Every country, yeah. Thank you. Um, Simon and Rob, any final thoughts from you? Uh, but yeah, what, I mean, what Tony was just, sorry, sorry, what Tony was saying about the weight, we tried pretty hard to try to get the boats sort of at 15, 20 kilos underweight, and we spent a lot of effort. It's a bit crazy then to go and put 20 to 30 kilos of lead in the bottom of a boat. So taking Tony's suggestion would be, would make sense if it's possible to do it to the, the, the racing fleet. That would be, that's... Exactly. That yeah. is something we need to study further and make sure we don't go to the, disenfranchise too many people. Yes. Yeah. I do. And Simon, last words from you tonight? 
Well, I'd, I'd like to echo really what Tony said. I think he, I think he's covered everything there, and I think you know it's great to have this chat with you guys and, and build up a rapport with you. And uh, you know, I think that's great for the class generally. So hopefully, we can keep that continuing and uh, build a friendship and and you know keep talking and keep this great fleet going. Excellent. And I think um, um, let's we'll hold you to that, and you can hold us to that. I think we'll um, we're definitely having more of these in conversation series, but. Um, I think staying in touch with you three uh, um, is really important to us and to the development of the class um, as it is through the World Council as well, obviously, but um, it's been fabulous to have you tonight. Um, so on behalf of SB20 Australia, thank you for joining us and our online audience from I think, Ireland, Portugal, Turkey and the UK and Australia, thank you very much for joining us. Um, as I think Tony said, uh, next year's Worlds will be in Cascais in Portugal. Um, we did slip across to Portugal after the 2017 Worlds, Steve and I, and had the best time, just a short holiday, but an absolutely magnificent place to sail, um, or we think we didn't sail, but um, lovely place to have a glass of wine, I do know that. Um, so we know that many of you are interested in actually sailing there. So next week we do, or next fortnight for our next series, we do have a, our theme is sailing in cash cash and we have Vasco Serba, who's the CEO of Sail Cash Cash, who um, Tony was talking about tonight. Um, he's going to be talking with us and with Michael Cooper, who is one of our local sailors who has sailed in Portugal a few times as well. Um, so thank you very much once again, and um, Sorry, you can, I give some info from, can I give some news from Turkey, what we are oh, doing please. in our 20 class right now? Please do so, please, perfect timing. Hello to everyone from Turkey. So um, as Simon, actually, we are all already in connection with them. So we just bought uh, two second-hand uh, SP20s in Europe, and we bought brought them to Turkey and uh, we are we are actually we're gonna actually sail in sports boat regatta and we already applied to our uh, Turkish Federation Sailing Federation to open a SP20 class under their uh, institution. We already have a SP J70 class and I'm sure uh, within this year we're also gonna have on a separate class within the Turkish Sailing Federation. Uh, and uh, right now we have 12 SP20s in Turkey. Uh, some of them are in good shape, including the one that we brought. And uh, we are planning to do separate one design races. And also we are gonna actually race uh, within the sports boat class. And uh, we are hoping that our federation gonna let us uh, race, uh, do double-handed races within this pandemic uh, period. So we are waiting uh, for the federation to open uh, the races soon, I guess, like in a month or something. Uh, so we, um, all the owners are always in connection. Uh, and um, we are also gonna actually let us race within each other within the uh, regatta of sports boat too. So I guess 20, this year is gonna be a good year for SP20 class in Turkey. That's fantastic, congratulations, well done. And we look forward to following you and to seeing what you share on Facebook and we'd love to, and, to share yeah, that. And, uh, there was, there's supposed to be actually ORC Europeans uh, in, this year in Istanbul, uh, but it's canceled of course due to the COVID problem. I hope that it will be actually uh, held in next year, 2021 again. And most of the, almost all 2020 SP20s, we're gonna attend that uh, event too. That's excellent news. What a um, lovely note to finish on tonight. Thanks for sharing that with us. Okay, um, see you. So thanks everyone. Um, we'll see you in a fortnight. Thanks again to our guests. And um, remember, if you do have a particular area of interest you'd like to us to explore, then um, just drop us a line to sb 20 australia at gmail.com. Um, stay safe and we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thanks, Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Nice see you, Tony. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye. Rob. Bye. 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 Okay. That's good. Thanks, Jane, if you if you can hear me.
Thanks, Simon. Yeah, lovely, lovely to meet you over the last fortnight. And uh, the the SB twenty five finding the SB twenty sailing um, boats around the place is actually quite fun. It's almost like where's Wally, isn't it? <laughs> well, that 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 was why I set it up because we we kept finding boats, and um, and I thought, well, let's let's set up a page and just see if anybody else, you know, if they're wandering around a yard somewhere, you know, spots a boat that's maybe sat there doing nothing, and we can. Um, you know, we can we can get it living again and get it you know get it sailing and uh, you know that's that's just going to help the fleet generally really. So, it, it's um, funny, yeah. um, Chap David Chapman, who he, he's not online now, but he um, he actually messaged me a couple of weeks ago and said, "What's this sale number?" Um, because he'd seen a boat that was actually in a car park in one of the yacht squadrons up in Sydney, so he was trying to track down who the owner was. So, um, which I think was was Jarvis Tilly, um, who's got a couple of boats. So. We might have a few. We're not sure how many we'd have tucked away in, in Australia. There'd probably be a few in Sydney, maybe in a, in WA in Western Australia as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, but just, yeah, you'll have a great um, series of photographs of them all in various states of disrepair, I guess. <laughs> well, those are, the, those are the ones, you know, that we found. And, and, and um, you know, it, I'm sure there must be plenty, you know, plenty around. I mean, I think a lot of the UK boats probably have migrated into Europe and elsewhere. Yeah. Um, um, but you know, we don't really know how many we've got left here uh, as such. I mean, as I said, we probably we probably recycled about ten or fifteen boats that have gone to new owners. We we've, we've you know found three or four ourselves, and there's still more out there. You know, we keep tripping over them. So I know I know the um, the forces have got one down about twenty miles away. There's another boat I found about two miles away. Um, it's been sat there for seven years. So we just want to try and get those going again. You know, and I think that's new. You know, just let's get them on the water, get them in. In new ownership and, and and get them sailing. So yeah, fantastic. Um, good for yeah. us, Simon, is that um, they've gone to like sailing schools and stuff, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, that's another thing. Yeah, um, three clubs now that have got them, and they I believe that well they were intending to all start get to race together, which then starts that whole thing off. Mm. Yes, it's um yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to have them all back on the water and um and just like we were saying the other night, as many boats, I mean not everyone's going to be going to world championships, but just building up local fleets and encouraging people back on the water, particularly people who haven't sailed before. I know there's a, quite a few women in Hobart who've been watching from the sidelines for some time, and they're not sailors, but they're itching to get on, and um, uh, I'm one of those. So my husband hasn't taken me out yet, but he's he's offered plenty of times, but. I said, I see how you crash the boats, you see, so I, I don't want to be on when we go over. <laughs> anyway. like, like, like I think, like we said on the phone the other day, I think it's, you know, it's the, that core bunch of, of the sort of club sailors that make up the fleet and make the numbers up, you know, so, so the good, you know, so that sort of top 10% of the fleet have got someone to sail against. So it's, you know, it's important you have both ends of the fleet racing and keeping those, keeping that volume. So, yeah, um, you know, that's where we're, we're working at really. Yeah, exactly. And I think the, um, as we're saying, the COVID pandemic has probably made people really realise what they've missed. So I'm hoping that will get people, you know, more likely to be back out on the water when they can because they've really missed missed that opportunity. So, but so lovely to meet you both. Thank you so much. And we will um, take you up on the offer of staying in contact if that's okay. Uh, maybe just before the season starts or at a at, at, at a at a. Um, Dinner or something that we might be having, or a presentation, we might um, we might hook you in as a as a guest speaker, all of you. So, thanks so much for spending your time with us this morning. We really really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Stay, stay safe. Take care. Okay, bye.